<laughs> this was my grand master plan. <laughs> I will not appear on the newest Olympian until the Mets have a better record than the Yankees. Good. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Newest Olympian. My name is Mike Schuber. I'm the titular Newest Olympian. I'm a grown man who never read the Percy Jackson books as a kid, but I'm reading them now as an adult because I'm on a quest to determine if this is a book series that we've all been sleeping on as a society. And I am not on this quest alone. I am joined by a repeat guest, someone who had a stone cold poker face when I made wild predictions during his first run on the podcast. It's the co-host and co-creator of Tipping Pitches and a podcast producer at The Ringer, Bobby Wagner. Bobby, how's it going? Mike, we've been on many a podcast together. We've never recorded a podcast in person, though. No, look at us Sitting in the same room. Are we going to be able to do it? Are we going to be, like, really awkward, like when we went back into the (laughs) real world after COVID? Like, what's this going to be like, man? Is the chemistry going to actually be worse? We've never looked each other in the eye and recorded in person before. So, yeah, I think we're going to be fine. We had a nice little chat pre-recording, and I think we're going to just have a swimming time doing two episodes worth of stuff. Finally getting back in the mix where I've got people on for back-to-back episodes. Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be invited back. And I'm glad that people read my letting you make wild predictions as being a good guest and not just (laughs) forgetting things that were going to happen later in the book. (laughs) Look, you knew everything that was going to take place and you did a good job of not speaking up. Glad to have you back. Now, because you are a repeat guest, what we're doing instead of asking people what their history with the Percy Jackson books is, since you've already answered that. Have you ever taken one of those godly parent quizzes or if you had to pick a godlike parent from the Percy Jackson universe or just Greek mythology in general, where do you think you fit in? I took one of those this morning as I was preparing for this podcast because I thought that you might ask something similar. And I remember on the first time I appeared on the show, we were talking about how when I read the first book and Percy went into water for the first time, I was thinking... Maybe I should just try going into water. Will that make me feel strong? It's Poseidon, actually, my father, but uh, I'm not a very good swimmer. I don't like the ocean. Mm. However, the quiz mm. that I took this morning did tell me that I would be a son of Poseidon. Look at so us. I'm going to have to overcome my fear of the thing that makes me strong, I guess. Maybe you're just going to go full Neville Longbottom where you will find yourself making sense with this sorting, if you will, by the end of it. But hey, look at us little half-brothers, I guess, because I also was sorted into Poseidon canon. Is this like selection bias for people who are reading a book where the main character is the son of Poseidon? Like, is that maybe making us choose things that would put us into that camp? It could be. It would be maybe a bad look for me since I also was a Gryffindor for Harry (laughs) Potter, (laughs) where I'm just like, I'm the main character of everything. Clearly, I am. (laughs) But no, I've only taken the Rick Riordan quiz, which was a bit obvious, and it's pretty easy to tell what you're going to get. Oh, depending do you, on the question. Do questions. you choose the color that looks exactly like the ocean? <laughs> the problem is I genuinely love the ocean and I grew up going to the ocean so much. Went to the Jersey Shore all the time. My friends lived blocks away from where they filmed the documentary series Jersey Shore. Well, the chapter that we're about to talk about, chapter eight, it starts, the first sentence says down the beach. And I literally thought Mike's going to be so annoyed that they didn't say down the shore. I know. I guess they weren't <laughs> talking about the Jersey Shore. No. No. So I had like hours long arguments with people about what do you call the beach? What do you call the shore? Mm-hmm. What phraseology do you have to use to be able to say down the shore? When does it count? When does it not count? Once you're there, is it still the shore or are you at the beach? Then I remember multiple times in middle school being disciplined for yelling at friends about this exact argument. I think if I had to answer this question, I would say that the shore is a location, mm-hmm. almost like a proper noun. Where the shore refers to any New Jersey beach. Okay. But when you get to the shore, the beach is kind of just like the general Mm. common noun version. You are at the beach, but if someone said what beach, you would say the shore. Okay. (laughs) Now, to answer you your question, how ridiculous you yes. sound right oh, 100%. now. Oh, 100%. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this is a state who can't make up their minds if it's called pork roll or Taylor ham. Or like, whether there <laughs> even is a central part of it. There is. There is. As someone from central Jersey, it's real. 
The other thing I will say about the going down the shore thing, mm. any direction is down. Yes. Any, oh, yeah. any direction. East, <laughs> north, yes. south, it's all down. It's all down. You can't go west to the shore, though, no. because it's the Atlantic Ocean. Sure, right. That's the only thing that's rolled out. But yes, for me, we would always go east and I think actually a little bit north, but we would always go down the shore. And that extrapolated into, I just say going down any direction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To where when I moved. I came down to the studio today, even though I definitely went north. Right. So this happened to me when I moved to Texas and I would say, oh, I'm going down to Austin this weekend. And they'd be like, um, Austin's actually north and west of Houston. I'd be like, what do you? Yeah, I knew Texans that. Texans being specific? No. <sighs> They're very particular <laughs> for a bunch of people that pronounce the H in vehicle. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on. We are clearly here to discuss Percy Jackson. We're going to be continuing chapter eight and getting into chapter nine in this episode. Chapter eight is called I Make a Dangerous Promise. And at the very end, we'll see that dangerous promise. But where we last left our heroes, we had Percy saving a weird cow serpent baby thing from the ocean. And as then, one does. <laughs> as one does. And then returning to Camp Half-Blood on trans-pegasus icon Blackjack. <laughs> so Blackjack flies Percy back to his cabin. And then Percy sees Nico crouched by a column, and it's clear that he is hiding from someone. Percy is confused because it's way too early for breakfast. Remember, he left at five in the morning. He has Blackjack drop him off near Nico, and he sneaks up behind him, and then he notices that Nico is spying on the hunters. And as narrator Percy, he says, quote, There were voices, two girls talking at one of the dining tables. At this ungodly hour of the morning? Well, unless you're the goddess of dawn, I guess. Perfect. Well, are you allowed to say ungodly? Shouldn't you be saying ungodsly? <laughs> oh, you're right, because they, they do. say, oh my gods, right? Yeah, I guess the difference there is that they have godly parents, so at least godly right. as one the is adverb a noun and one is, is an used. adjective, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, or yeah. adverb, I should yeah. say. Yes. Now, shout out to Sister Natalie, my fourth grade teacher, who would be very upset if we didn't correctly identify as an Welcome adverb. to Grammar 101. <laughs> You are no longer listening to the newest Olympian. You are listening to Sister Natalie's Grammar Podcast. <laughs> but yeah, I guess because they use godly, ungodly works. But if you said, oh, my God, then that would be favoritism because you're picking just one right, of exactly. them. Mm-hmm. So, yes, ungodly is I'm a great I'm pioneering the ungodly movement. That's going to be my thing. <laughs> so Percy then puts on Annabeth's cap and it works. He sneaks past. And here, let's get into Grammar Corner here. In the past tense, because as the narrator, he talks in the past tense. Mm -hmm. Narrator Percy says, he sneaked past them. Is it not snuck? I thought the exact same thing. I think it's probably one of those things that can technically work either way. And we just have one that we've defaulted more to in American English. According to Google, sneaked and snuck both function as the past tense and past participle of the verb sneak. This is from masterclass.com. That's the one that Google pulled at the top, not Miriam Webster. Masterclass is too powerful, bro. We got it like every single week because I had a free masterclass trial for six months. Every single week, it's like, here's President Obama teaching you how to give speeches. I'm like, where is all the money coming from, Mike? Where is the money coming from? (laughs) I also like that Masterclass has sports ones, and I know they have a Steph Curry shooting one, but it would be funny if the Masterclass Steph Curry class one just goes, step one, be over six foot three, <laughs> like Steph Curry is. Step one, have a father who was a very good NBA three-point shooter. <laughs> <laughs> step number one, be tall as hell. I'm waiting for the Masterclass that's like, here's your mom teaching you how to make all of your family recipes. I'm like, this is getting way too personal. We need maybe not Masterclass, but just class and it's like here's how you do laundry (laughs) just class yeah just class let's start it you and i class sounds good that's now our ip now if anybody Mm -hmm. is listening to this who's a venture capitalist please contact us here's why you should start investing in a roth ira because eventually you (laughs) can't so i guess you can use sneaked or snuck but it feels like one of the ones like octopuses or octopi where Mm -hmm. one of them is more correct octopi is more correct snuck Snuck is is more more correct correct. for sure (laughs) yes Percy sneaks past Nico and gets close enough to hear that these two voices are, obviously, Zoe and Bianca arguing. Now, apparently, the Stoles put centaur blood on the inside of the shirt that they gave to Phoebe, which will have her bedridden for weeks with hives, which is gross, but also good. I didn't want to have to start pretending to care about Phoebe. (laughs) It's a really bad beat for Phoebe, who doesn't get to say a line in the whole book and just gets poisoned. Like, ooh. Right. We don't even have confirmation if she was the person that was getting into the fight at the pickup basketball game. It's just assumed that she is. We see that yeah. she arm wrestles, and that's it. So yeah. she's tough. But tough beat. Yeah, what's really tough is that for a prophecy where two people are supposed to die slash one gets lost, whatever, 
it would have been nice to have a person we don't care about. Now we're only going to have people we care about. Yeah. I have some thoughts about that, but I'll save them for later. Great. Bianca brings up that they need five people for the prophecy, but Zoe says there's no time because they must leave this morning. And she tries to reason that, quote, losing one in the land without rain could be the camp because the camp has magic borders. And I'm just going to get out my yoga mat and get into Warrior 2 because that's a stretch. (laughs) I know. It's just like, oh, did you think they were going to make it really convenient for you? It already counts. You're already starting your journey now where you're comfortably sitting here just talking about the prophecy. No. No. Yeah, this felt very much middle school homework assignment where you're really trying to yes. find some way to make a thing work to fit your narrative. Bianca tries to protest, but Zoe says that she has a feeling that they should not pick someone else because they will face a terrible fate. Now, my prediction kind of here was, all right, well, the fifth person is going to be Percy and he's probably going to have a tough fate. It's kind of how things go. So, mm-hmm. like, maybe Zoe's instinct is correct. We'll just have to see. Bianca says that Zoe should tell Thalia the rest of her dream, and Zoe says that will not help, but Bianca counters that it could be helpful if her suspicions about the general are right, but Zoe refuses to discuss it further. So they start to run back to their cabin, Nico scurries away, Percy sidesteps because Nico is going to run into him, and Bianca notes that the big house lights are on, so they have to hurry. Percy can tell that Nico is about to approach Bianca, so he takes off the cap and tells him to wait, startling him. And that surprise immediately turns to awe when Percy explains to Nico the invisibility cap situation. And narrator Percy then notes that Nico mouthed the words invisible and then says, wow, cool, which is (laughs) my big takeaway about everything that happens to all of these kids is that they are way cooler about it than I would be if these (laughs) things were happening to me. Like if someone just had an invisibility cap on and then popped up right next to me, it would take me like a good hour to get over that probably. If Mm -hmm. there was somebody in the studio with us right now who took an invisibility (laughs) cap off, we wouldn't just keep recording the pod, Mike. We wouldn't do that. No, not at all. But now that we've talked about the cap, I feel like I have to be fair in that it is a Yankees cap. I'm a mm-hmm. big Yankees fan. I'm currently wearing a Yankees cap signed by your favorite player of all time, Alex Rodriguez. You're a big <laughs> Mets guy. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. Now, we had this recording scheduled for earlier in the year when mm-hmm. the Yankees were doing better than the Mets. And right. now in the two weeks that we delayed it, now the Mets are doing better than the Yankees. And I'm furious. <laughs> <laughs> this was my grand master plan. <laughs> I will not appear on the newest Olympian until the Mets have a better record than the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> but got to give you your due. Shout out to the Mets. They're playing very well right now. I refuse mm-hmm. to jinx it. We can't talk about this anymore. Yeah, let's knock on some wood. <laughs> I would hope that the Yankees turn it around. They're playing quite poorly, but I think we've kind of just taken the foot off the gas because a lot of our guys are injured and we're way up in the AO East. Yes. So I think it's okay. Yes, I think that you're going to be fine. I hope so. Knocks on wood. <laughs> Now, when Percy asks Nico how he knew Zoe and Bianca were talking, Nico says that he heard them walk by his cabin because he hasn't been sleeping too well at camp, which makes me feel really bad for Nico. Percy then guesses that Nico wants to follow them. And when Nico asks him how he knew that, Percy says, well, if it was my sister, I'd be thinking the same thing. So shout out to Percy. And for a half a second, I was like, wait, does Percy have a sister? No, Percy doesn't have a sister. Percy goes on to say that Nico can't go because he's too young and the group would send him back here anyway once they inevitably realized he was following them. Percy says that it's probably for the best, though, because there will likely be monsters worse than the manticore along the way. Nico understands, but then suggests that Percy can go for him. And Percy's confused, but Nico says, you can turn invisible so you can go. And Percy says that it would be big trouble if they found out. So then Nico gives the best advice possible, quote, don't let them find out. (laughs) How long can you reasonably be invisible for before it's like... You're knocking stuff over or like because they know he has the ability to become invisible. Like they might start suspecting things Mm -hmm. if he's just like picking up food off the shelves or like drinking things and something like that. Like I don't think that you could really just be invisible present with a group for that long. No, it's not a good plan, but it was made by a 10 year old. So, yeah, (laughs) I don't think Percy would be able to hide it. I certainly wouldn't be able to hide it. I would inevitably crack my knuckles or something (laughs) five minutes in. And then, yeah, oh, yeah. Plans over. I don't know if you ever heard me sneeze. I do this cool thing that normal humans do where I sneeze in sets of five. Five. Almost every time. That's a lot. That's a lot. I know a a lot of like three or four, but five, it's like at that point, it's like, all right, dude, I I don't want to say bless you anymore. (laughs) Mm -hmm. My high score is 14. Uh, 14. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> Have we checked the Guinness Book of World Records? 
<laughs> yeah, let's get someone out. We can make it happen. I'm a photosensitive sneezer. So if I go into a dark room like a movie theater or when I set this record, it was laser tag at a birthday party in middle school. Tough time. Once I go out into the light. Away your position. <laughs> well, thankfully it was afterwards okay. when we left the arena and then it was back in the <laughs> light and I sneezed a lot and all my friends thought I was dying. So yeah, I would be not good at being yeah, you're invisible. Not the dude. You're not the dude to give the cap to. Not very sneaky. When Percy tries to push back again, Nico asks if he was planning on going anyway. And narrator Percy reveals that he wanted to say no, but he couldn't bring himself to lie to Nico after Nico looked him right in the eyes. Yeah. Nico says that he won't rat out Percy, but Percy's got to promise that he will keep Bianca safe. And Percy says that that's a big thing to promise. And then I wrote in my notes, oh, man, I don't have high hopes for Bianca on this mission. This isn't great. Clearly, this is the title's aforementioned promise. Nico insists that Percy promises, and Percy does, but he kind of caveats it by saying that he promises to do his best, which is the best legalese way to say it without getting into trouble. Percy's just like <laughs> the Democrats posting. He's like, we're going to do our oh, we're gonna no. do our darndest. You know, we're going to try to fix everything. But, uh, you know, it's not always under our control. Uh, I'm just imagining a fundraising email from Percy Jackson. <laughs> I need $15 to save to Bianca. To save Bianca. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Nico is satisfied by this promise, and he tells Percy to go and wishes him good luck. Percy rushes to get ready since he hasn't packed, and he begins to tell Nico something to tell Chiron, but Nico says, look, I'll make something up. I'm good at it. Just go. And Percy runs up that hill, much to Kate Bush's delight, and he sees <laughs> that the Camp Half-Blood van is driving down the road away from the camp, so he really can't pack at all. He's just got to go. He's unsure of how he's going to keep up, but then Blackjack approaches and says, quote, if I was guessing, boss, and I'm sorry, I need to take this extreme New York voice for Blackjack is my headcanon. <laughs> if I was guessing, boss, I'd say you need a getaway horse. You interested? And narrative Percy <laughs> says, a lump of gratitude stuck in my throat, but I managed to say, yeah, let's fly, which is a pretty cool line, and I imagined that it was immediately followed by the CSI Miami yeah! <laughs> right after I think it's at this point I think it's more than your head canon that that's how blackjack talks like that's pretty textual at this point <laughs> with the way it's like yeah boss it's just <laughs> we're gonna fly we need to do it it reminds me of um, a star is born lady gaga's dad and they're all just like limousine drivers like why do all of the pegasi talk like they're new york limousine drivers we talked about this in a previous episode but the boss could be blackjack deferring to percy but because the first thing we hear blackjack say is whoa boss i cannot remove whoa Ooh, whoa, boss, whoa hey, hey. Hey. I can't get it out of my mind. <laughs> There's a lot of Italian references in this book. Nico D'Angelo, Bianca D'Angelo. I love your Del Vecchio thing. I have to. I have <laughs> to tip you. my cap to that. As the baseball person who comes on these podcasts, I have to tip my cap to the backyard baseball reference. Oh, it's so good. We got to get our backyard baseball league going with Kyle Manduho. We, <laughs> we got to get it yeah, happening. We do. we do need to do it. Hey, this is Mike from the future, and Mike from the past is just about to tee up the mid-roll break, which is where I would normally talk about these sorts of things, but it's very important in a timely manner, so I want to make sure that you hear this in case you're someone that skips the mid-roll break. That's okay. I'm not your mom. I can't tell you what to do or what to not do, but I wanted to make sure that you knew two important things are happening this week. This comes out on August 22nd. On August 24th, we're having the first ever TNO live show in New York City, but we're also streaming it everywhere, so if you get the internet, you can watch a stream, and it comes with a one-week replay, so you don't have to watch it exactly live if it's not convenient. And then also on August 26th, Six, Stephen Parra and I are doing a Hades the Video Game live stream because we hit 1,000 patrons. I'll talk more in detail about those in the mid-roll break, so listen if you want to know more, but I wanted to make sure you knew that those are happening this week. It's time-sensitive. Anyway, let's get back to the podcast. I promise not to do this often. It's just very timely because this is the first ever live show, and then also, we had to schedule the game stream on very short notice because of our schedules. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the episode. So we're about to get into chapter nine. Let's take a little bit of a break for the Titans purse as we talk about cool things happening, such as the live shows and live streams and all the other fun stuff in the mid-roll break. Hello and welcome to the Titans Purse. I appreciate that you are not a person that skips it. If you are a person that skips it and this is your first time, welcome. It's very fun here. You're missing out, but that's okay. They're all still here on the podcast. You can listen to them going forward. Regardless, we have lots of fun things to discuss. So let's discuss those fun things. First fun thing I mentioned, we've got that TNO live show. You can get tickets to it, whether you're coming in person in New York City. We are almost sold out of tickets. Or if you are going to watch the stream, it is impossible to sell out of those tickets. You can get them at thenewsolympian.com slash live, as I mentioned. 
You get a one week replay so you don't have to watch it the day or the time it comes out or you can rewatch it totally chill. The other thing I mentioned, we are doing the patron live stream of Hades the video game, which is going to be a hoot and a half and it will be taking place on this Friday, August 26th at 6 p.m. Eastern. To clarify, you must be a patron to watch that stream, but we will have a link to it with a replay so even if you can't watch on that day or at that time, that's all right. It's 6 p.m. Eastern time and it's going to run for three hours. We're going to see how far I can get through a brand new save file of Hades. I will be playing. Steven will be my man in the chair. He's done this sort of thing a lot before and I've never done it. I've played a lot of Hades the video game, but I've never done a start from scratch file. So Steven's going to be kind of guiding me and also providing more fun commentary. If I'm really into the game and I'm not talking a lot, it'll be silly. It'll be fun. It'll be chill. You can watch the replay. You can watch part of it, whatever works for you, but you must be a patron in order to watch it. It's a patron exclusive thing as a thank you to all of the folks who got us to 1000 patrons. So if you want to watch it, even though you weren't part of the first 1000, that is okay. Any patron can watch it. So it's totally fine if you're joining a little bit later and you just want to make sure you can watch this thing. Totally fine. I appreciate anybody that joins at any tier at any point in time for any duration. If you go to the newsolympian.com slash Patreon, you can join and make sure that you watch it. And also if financials aren't great right now, you can't join, but you want to watch this after the fact that video replay will always be available. It's not a one week limited thing like with the live shows. So if you join the Patreon at any point in time, you'll be able to watch this stream. So if money's a little tight, please don't put yourself into any sort of financial duress to watch this. You can wait until things are better and then you can chip in that $5 minimum and then you'll be able to watch. Now, speaking of patrons to thank, we have a whole lot of patrons to thank because a bunch of people joined in the push to get us to 1,000, and I'm happy to report that I must institute the rule where I don't read more than 50 patron names in an episode so that the mid-roll isn't too long. We have not had to do this since the beginning of the podcast, which is wild. So thank you to 50 of the most recent people who joined our team, which includes Ultra God Tier patrons, Shatza Bobs and Heck Emily, Mega God, Sandy Kelly, Super Super Gods, Shannon Williams, Jenna, Brian Hamp, Joy, Alexandra Denton, and Apocalypso. Gods, Pian Van Putten. Mahi is sponsored by the aliens. I'm a monster donut kid. Kara Clifford, Susan, Kelly Branson, Nisha G, Panda Queen 13, Faven Glevick, Hide Bayer, Marit, Kyra, Yvonne Dryberg, Jack Babcock, Megnog 14, Alex Diotti, and Emma Caven. And demigods Trey Wisebrod, Megan L, Renske Rademaker, Marnie Cope, Eva Leverton, Sophie Lewis, The Wine Dude, Emma Gazale, Bubbly Bear, Rachel Barlow, Genevieve Cassidy, Emily E, Austin Cavate, Colleen Borkson, Drew Sinez, Wit202, Athena Vine, Annie, Emma Register, Nova Knight, Natalie, Cassandra Chrome, Veronica Krieger, Cassidy Mace, and Olivia Rose. Now, if I messed up any of your names, please message me on Patreon and I will do name corrections. There were a whole lot of names, so the percentage chance that I messed up at least one of them is hi, send me a DM on Patreon and I'll do a name correction in the future. But thank you all so much for your support. May Hephaestus bless you to make sure that you don't have any technical difficulties, especially if you're streaming Hades the Video Game live for all of your patrons. Maybe that was a bit of a specific one for me, but I would really love if things went well there. Also, a friendly reminder that we are taking the next Monday off. August is a five-Monday month. I always take off one of the Mondays in a five-Monday month just so I can get some rest and catch up on various work. There will be content that I post on the Potterless feed on the 29th, so you can check that out. So you're not going to be without Mike Schubert book content. It's just not going to be of the Percy Jackson variety. And then we'll be back with another new episode on September 5th. And before we wrap up here, you're going to hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of these ads will be read by me. Others of them won't. The ones that are not read by me are inserted locally. So if you live in the Philippines, don't be surprised if you hear an ad either in Filipino or in English, because at least according to Google, those are both languages spoken in the Philippines. But once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of the News Olympian. And we're back, and we're here to discuss chapter nine, which is called I Learn How to Grow Zombies, which there have been some wild, wild chapter titles. I feel like this is the first in a while where I have been truly floored by it. And I always try to make a guess. My guess was, I don't know, some sort of Greek thing where you can summon allies out of dirt or something. I don't know. Pretty good prediction. <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty good. good. Pretty good. <laughs> allies depends on which perspective you're looking at it from, but sure. Right. I guess because it was called I Learn How to Grow Zombies, yes. I figured it might be Percy. But then knowing Rick's tricks, I thought, okay, even if someone else grows them, even if a villain grows them, he could still technically mm -hmm. learn how to do it, even though he slash a friend doesn't do Let's it. Let's go back to grammar school really quickly. <laughs> 
I learn how one grows zombies, Percy. Yeah, that that would be a little bit better. <laughs> yes, that would be more clear. You're right, Rick. We're really getting on Rick, professional <laughs> author's grammar. In today's episode. New York Times bestseller before I was out of middle school. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, look, but I've been reading books on podcasts for six years. Yeah, so, Rick, I on, mean. <laughs> no, no, no. We need to be nice because he needs to come on the pod. Rick, it's time. Rick, come please, on the pod, please, Rick. Rick. Please, please, please. Disney, come on. It would be great promotion. Let's make it happen. So, they are tailing the van. Percy is freezing because they have to fly up in the clouds. And he says he wasn't able to pack. Was he wearing a jacket at this point? Because later in the chapter, he Unclear. references wearing a jacket. And Unclear. I was confused. Unclear. Okay. He says that he's freezing, which is basically all we get about his outfit. Mm-hmm. I kind of assume he's always just wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Like, mm-hmm. that's how I picture him yes. dressed. Got his orange camp half-load shirt. Impractical jeans. as it might be in the middle of winter in New York. Jeans and a t-shirt. Do you think he's wearing Converse's? Or do people just draw him wearing Converse's because nerds think the only sneaker that exists is Converse's. I kind of feel like, didn't more people wear Vans at this time than Converse's? Like high top Vans or like the skater no lace Vans? Skate I picture shoes him wearing, big. wearing Vans. Mid-2000s, I was wearing skate shoes even though I barely skateboarded. I had some Etnies and I oh, gosh. don't know if I had any others. I definitely had at least one pair of Etnies. Yeah. But yeah, I feel like people had Etnies, DC, ES, element like those were kind of the shoes this is just like (laughs) going deep into the recesses of my brain (laughs) you listing off these brands like wow i feel like i just smelled hot topic briefly just now either a hot topic or a pack sun yeah exactly ideally they're right next to each other definitely (laughs) so yeah i don't know if he'd be a converse guy but i still accept folks who believe that he is a Converse wear. I've just never been a Converse wear because I like to wear shoes, not socks with some leather on the bottom of them. Yeah, they're really painful to wear. <laughs> they're really like not made for walking, which is what you do in shoes most of the time. <laughs> remember when NBA players wore those during games? Yeah, and remember when their careers were six years because it shredded all of their ligaments? Yeah, I remember touché, that. Touche, touche, touche. Narrator Percy says, quote, I was wishing I'd brought some of that Camp Half-Blood orange thermal underwear they sold in the camp store, but after the story about Phoebe and the Centaur Blood t-shirt, I wasn't sure I trusted their products anymore. Why is there not enough of this? I feel like I see orange Camp Half-Blood shirts everywhere. I've been gifted some Camp Half-Blood shirts, which is very kind and very selfless of the folks who did so. I feel like there is not enough folks wearing thermal underwear this should be a big thing come on that's so cool (laughs) drop the link baby somebody find us the link disney the merch opportunities they're just leaving they're just leaving money on the table we're just trying to make a money mike (sighs) disney come on disney corporation needs our financial advice clearly they're not doing well at making (laughs) money hit us up we can help you make some merch money when he said that i was like so you're telling me that these demigods go through all of this trauma. They finally come to Camp Half-Blood and then they get charged money for clothes at the camp store? Like, this is just... Shouldn't this place have endless funding? Like, can we get a grant from Olympus to not have to charge these children money for pants? Maybe there is a camp currency type thing. Mm. Maybe there's some Chiron like bucks or something. Dollars. Yes, yeah. right. At Rice, there were Tetra points. Mm. So you were NYU? NYU. Did, yeah. They there were any... just called dining dollars. Okay, they weren't like purple bucks. Yeah, they were too pretentious to come up with a better name than that. <laughs> we're yeah. too busy in film school, Mike. Oh, uh, yes. Well, I mean, I think Tetra was the company that made like the, the currency, which is why we were Tetra <laughs> points. I don't think it was any sort of Well, it would have been pun. really bleak if they made them Aramark bucks because there was like active protests going on against Aramark on campus oh. because they were providing food for for-profit prisons and NYU students clearly did not care for that action. I mean, that's bad. Yeah, it was really bad. That's really bad. It was really bad. So yeah, maybe there's some internal Camp Half-Blood currency where you can do extra chores and get some money and then you can buy stuff in the gift shop. So indentured servitude then. Ugh, man. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm maybe just kidding. there's a foosball table machine and you get tickets and when it's like Chuck E. Cheese and <laughs> you can get stuff with tickets. I like that idea. That's definitely it. Now, Percy figures that the van will eventually go into Manhattan, so he steers Blackjack into Manhattan, and they go to the top of the Chrysler building, which is very cool. Such a vibe, and it's also the cover of the book that I have. So pretty early on, great cover, 
We know what's going on there. Fantastic. He figures that the van is going to pull into the bus station. This is what happened before. They took the van to the bus station and then they got on the bus. I didn't think that's what was going to happen. It's not what happens. Percy wonders aloud where Argus is taking them, but Blackjack corrects him that Argus isn't driving. Zoe is, which made me say, whoa. And then I wrote my notes, whoa because <laughs> I'm surprised that Zoe could drive. Yeah. I thought she was a teenager. But then Percy remembers and... That reminded me, she is immortal, so who's to say what her actual age is, even though she's taking the form of a 12-ish year old? I'm concerned about her being able to reach the pedals on this van, but, you know, it is what it is. It's a book. (laughs) Mm -hmm. She hasn't crashed yet on the Long Island Expressway. (laughs) Shout out to the LIE. (laughs) So immediately after this reveal, Blackjack asks if they can swing by a donut shop to grab some to-go food. But Percy has to tell him that doing so would give every cop in there a heart attack. But Blackjack doesn't get it. Clearly, Percy gets it, though. That's right. Percy. (laughs) I thought the exact same thing. I was like, would that be so bad? (laughs) I just miss, we got to bring back media where cops are just blubbering fools. Yes, lazy, incompetent. Yes. Eating donuts, not solving anything. We have way too many shows about cops being superheroes. And it's excessive. I miss the 80s where it was like police academy and stuff where it's like, lol, look at the cops or the Blues Brothers or it's like, there's 500 police officers and they can't arrest two guys in sunglasses. <laughs> like this line, I was like, thank you, based person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the van heads towards the Lincoln Tunnel and I got very excited because that means it's going to one place and one place only, New Jersey. <laughs> Narrator Percy notes that he is surprised that Zoe can drive, but then this is when he remembers the whole immortality thing. He wonders if Zoe has a New York driver's license or a permit, and if so, what the birthday says. I am intrigued to know how old Zoe is, and it only gets more confusing as the chapter goes on. Yes. Percy says to Blackjack that they should head after them, but Blackjack whinnies in fear after seeing what looks like a snake wrap around Percy's leg. But it wasn't a snake. It was a snake lobster. Now, it's vines because Mr. D is here, apparently. And Blackjack says, God alert, it's the wine, dude. (laughs) That's what I want people to say about me. When I walk into the room, you know, we're about to have dinner. Hey, it's the wine, dude. (laughs) At the very least, you could be the podcast dude or the baseball dude. I'm already that dude. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You get, you want to get a yeah, new I, dude I status. Advance. I feel like that's an upgrade. Wine dude. Yeah. I will never become a wine dude. I only buy things based on getting something in the good price range. And if the label slash name is cool, that's my uh, <laughs> wine tastes. That's my uh, sommelier knowledge. That's a, I mean, that's a good way to go. It's a good rule of thumb between mm-hmm. 10 and $25. Get yep, it done. That's what you need. And when I was in France, I couldn't recognize any of the words. It so, all tasted good, though. I mean, it was all amazing. So what would I buy? Would I buy Chateau Bel Air every time? Yes, because Fresh Prince <laughs> of Bel Air is one of my favorite TV shows. That's really and funny. it really didn't matter, although it was so good and cost $5. Yep. $5. Yeah, they got something figured out over there. They really do. They've got it nailed. <laughs> yes. So. We've been alerted that the wine dude is here. That upsets Mr. D. He says, quote, the next person or horse in italics who calls me the wine dude in quotes will end up in a bottle of Merlot. Well, if he doesn't want the title, I'm just saying, <laughs> I'll take it. I'll Let take me the title. be the wine dude. <laughs> Percy asks what Mr. D wants, and he sassily asks if Percy really thought that the camp director, and he says something like the all-knowing camp director, wouldn't notice Percy sneaking out. And Percy says, well... Maybe. Good point. (laughs) (laughs) Touche, Mr. D. Mr. D says that he ought to throw Percy off of the building, but then PJ asks Mr. D why he hates him and what he ever did to Mr. D. And Mr. D says that him being a hero is enough. Percy then says that he has to go on this quest to help his friends, which is something that Mr. D wouldn't understand. And Blackjack warns Percy to be nicer to Mr. D since they are wrapped up in vines 900 feet in the air. (laughs) Good point, Blackjack. Good head on his horse shoulders. The vines grip tighter as Mr. D asks, quote, did I ever tell you about... Ariadne? Ariadne? Ariadne, I think. Cool. Ariadne. If I'm wrong with the pronunciation, send your tweets to at Brandon Grugel on Twitter. (laughs) Continuing, Mr. D says, beautiful young princess of Crete. She liked helping her friends, too. In fact, she helped a young hero named Theseus, also a son of Poseidon. She gave him a ball of magical yarn that let him find his way out of the labyrinth. And do you know how Theseus rewarded her? And narrator Percy says, the answer I wanted to give him was, I don't care. But I didn't figure that would make Mr. D finish his story any faster <laughs> the rare angsty percy jackson seriously, mm. seriously. <laughs> but what percy actually says is that they got married and they lived happily ever 
thereafter, and Mr. D sneers and corrects him that Theseus said he would marry her, but halfway back from sailing to Athens, he dumped her on the island of Naxos, and Mr. D found her there crying alone and heartbroken. What's really funny about anytime you're hearing a story about a previous demigod is that most of the time it can be summed up in that they were basically just boys. <laughs> like they just behaved like boys. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And that's why heroes have such a bad reputation. <laughs> Percy agrees that it was wrong of Theseus to do so, but he wonders what this has to do with him since this took place thousands of years ago. Mr. D clarifies that he fell in love with Ariadne, and he healed her broken heart, and when she died, he made her his immortal wife on Olympus, and he plans to return to her when his punishment is over. And Percy, like me, is surprised that he's married, given <laughs> that his crime that he was punished for was chasing after a wood nymph. Mm -hmm. Doesn't feel like married guy behavior. But does feel like God behavior, though, for right. what we know. I feel like, how does Percy not know that he's married? How does everyone not know that everyone is married? Isn't there like a yellow pages for the gods <laughs> that they can consult, you know, like an address book or something that we can see that Mr. D is married to Ariadne and Zeus is married to Hera and Artemis and Apollo are twins. Like this information should be more readily available. My only guess would be that Percy hasn't known a whole lot of Greek stuff. He had the one Latin class with Mr. Brunner Chiron. Mm -hmm. And then every time he's tried to go to camp, he's been interrupted by these big quests. Where and now that the Cronus entire known is universe. coming back, he has to train for that. <laughs> so I feel like they might have pulled the, all right, you can learn the book stuff later. Maybe figure out how to sword fight. Yeah. So maybe yeah. they kind of adjusted the core scheduling for him where he doesn't really know everything. Yeah, I'm with it. I understand. But... Percy, read a damn book, dude. You're like often <laughs> on trains or planes or automobiles. Like you got some free time. <laughs> Mr. D doesn't address this, but instead notes that his point is that heroes never change. They call gods vain, but they too are vain. They take what they want, they use whoever they want, and they betray everyone around them. He calls heroes a selfish, ungrateful lot, and if Percy doesn't believe him, he should ask Ariadne or Medea or Zoe. And Percy asks, what do you mean by Zoe? And Mr. D tells him to go follow his friends and waves his hand in a waving motion. The vines release Percy, who is confused as to why Mr. D would let him go so easily, and Mr. D's reason reasoning is that the prophecy said that two will die, so he hopes he'll get lucky and that Percy will be one of the two. Mr. D was kind of spitting here. I gotta be <laughs> honest. Like, he's kind of right about heroes. I mean, he's had a big come up, and I understand because even just three episodes ago, when Mr. D was being really rude about Annabeth being missing, yeah. I was on the big anti-Mr. D train. He has been very funny and now very... Correct. <laughs> Since I've kind of called him out, so I would like to retroactively apologize to Mr. D and my guest Erin, who she did warn me, maybe just wait a little bit. You might yeah. understand where Mr. D is coming from. Mr. Now D rebranding as like a truth telling podcaster. Like, I'm just here to tell it like it is. Like, you might not like it, but I'm here to tell you how it is. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. D then says, but mark my words, son of Poseidon, live or die, you will prove no better than the other heroes. And here's where I want Percy Jackson to take this as whiteboard material, bulletin board, bulletin board material, bathroom mirror material, <laughs> prove him wrong. <laughs> Just like the first ever article written about Pottery List ended with, quote, Mike Schubert might not make it in podcasting. Wow. He might just be a man with a seriously good idea. Shout out to that guy. Love it. <laughs> what an irrelevant thing to say. X person who just started might not make it in podcasting. Yeah, that's because there's 4 billion podcasts out there. <laughs> Anybody who makes a podcast might not make it in podcasting, but they also might. How about you just let people make things that are fun and cool? This dude's whole article, he was a British guy. His whole article was basically like... All right, you can stop the story right there, actually. <laughs> His whole article was... <laughs> Sorry to the British <laughs> listeners. I love you all very much. I'm just making jokes. Just making jokes. His article was, this podcast is a good idea, but I'm annoyed by the American not understanding the British stuff. Maybe it would be better if a British person hosted it. To which I say, it's funny when I don't understand the British things. Yeah. When I thought that treacle tart was a magical food item and not just British dessert, that's funny. <laughs> if you're British... And you don't understand that some things sound funny and ridiculous. Like, you're kind of missing the whole joy of it. You feel like you should just be leaning into that. Bro, they call sprinkles hundreds and thousands. <laughs> it's just too many syllables. That's so many syllables. It's sprinkles too... or jimmies. Two syllables. Jimmies is silly, but at least fewer syllables. The thing I like about jimmies is at least where I grew up, I think it's a Northeast thing and maybe a Midwest thing. But yeah. for me, jimmies are the 
tube-shaped ones, and sprinkles are the dots. So categorically, it makes a difference. Yeah. Regardless, sprinkles, jimmies, hundreds and thousands, five syllables? What? And how do you singular that? Do you call it A, 100 and 1,000? Like, what do you mean? Oh, look, can I have A? Can I have 100 and 1,000? Well, yeah, like, oh, look, A sprinkle. Oh, look, A, 100 and 1,000. How do you say A with something that has an and in the the middle of it? (laughs) To the linguistics podcast now. We're literally counting syllables out. This is what the people come for, but this is the premium content. Uh, Anyway, all that aside, I love the whiteboard material here. (laughs) I really hope. Percy proves Mr. D wrong and then shoves it in his face. I would love if he remembers the quote and then says something like, "Uh, didn't I prove myself to be better than other heroes? (laughs) That'd be so good. It'd be so good. Mr. D does the paper folding piece out maneuver and Percy actually feels more worried that Mr. D didn't take him back to camp because now he thinks, man, there must be a really good chance that I'm going to die on this quest if Mr. D's letting me go on it, (laughs) which is such a funny thing to think. I love how often Percy doubts himself because it's so genuine to how you would be feeling in the situation i feel like it helps you really relate to his lot in life where he's like i may or may not just get impaled by some mythological creature that i've never heard of and i guess i just gotta lean in on that it also informs a lot of his decision making because you could think oh wow he's acting so brashly but he is a person who's been told for the past couple of years you probably won't make it past 16 so yeah yeah, you're cooked bro why not go out swinging exactly (laughs) Exactly. He's just letting it rip. (laughs) It's bucket list category. He knows he's got a deadline. He's just living it up. It's like an NBA player in garbage time just launching from 40 (laughs) feet. He's like, might as well just shoot it. We're going to lose anyway. (laughs) Percy then says, quote, come on, Blackjack. I'll buy you some donuts in New Jersey. And then I wrote my notes. Yes. Narrative Percy. The next line, though, after a line break says, as it turned out, I didn't buy Blackjack donuts in New Jersey. And I wrote, no. (laughs) So apparently Zoe kept driving all the way to Maryland without stopping. And that is a four hour ish drive, depending on traffic, which is not too ridiculous for an adult, but for a teen and for a van that I doubt is a very fuel efficient automobile. A lot of questions. A lot of questions about the amount of gallons that the tank can hold. A lot of questions about how fast she's driving, because that's going to be worse for gas mileage, too. Mm -hmm. Is an electric van. We got the first hybrid van in 2007, or at least that's when the book was written. It's Prius kind of van. unclear. <laughs> Not sure, but four hours isn't absurd, but it could be a lot. So at least Percy is justified in being a little bit surprised. Now, Blackjack is mad tired, and Percy tells him to take a rest so that he can go scout out as the van has now stopped at a rest stop in Maryland. Blackjack says, stay here. I can handle. I can do that. <laughs> Now, first he's got the invisibility cap on and he heads over to the convenience store of the rest stop, but he still sneaks because it's hard to break the instinct, even though no one can see him, which I think is very funny. And then he also brings up that he has to just dodge people walking because they can't see him. And that's an aspect of invisibility I didn't really consider, but makes so much sense. That's sometimes how I feel walking down the street. I'm like, do you not? See me? I'm walking right in front of you and you're just not diverting your course at all. Sometimes it is astonishing what people will do on the sidewalks in New York. And it's not the New Yorkers because they know where they're going. They're going fast. They'll move around. They'll walk into a bike lane for a couple steps. It's the tourists and they don't know what they're doing. They're weaving back and forth. There's three people horizontally walking slow, taking up an entire sidewalk. There's people with dogs and their leashes go across the other side. So they're just Uh blocking the entire entire sidewalk. sidewalk, There's people looking down. There's a lot of times where I have to say like, look up, look up, look up. (laughs) Because I can't move. I'm in between people. I'm not trying to root. It's literally just like, look up from your phone, sir. You are going to walk into me. Well, I don't know if you've watched The Bear the FX show on Hulu. But of course, a lot of people were talking about it. They work in a restaurant and they're often yelling like behind, behind, mm-hmm. behind, corner. I was like, I think that we need to bring that to the streets, man. Yes. We need to, it needs to be normalized for me to just be like behind, mm-hmm. on your left, yeah, yeah, on yeah, your yeah. right. You know how like bikers do. Yes. And like when I'm coming around a corner, mm-hmm. corner, get out of the way. Corner would be good because yeah. I always, and this is just my thought, I treat sidewalks like a road. Yes. So if I'm walking on a sidewalk, and let's say there is a corner to my right, I feel like I have the walking right of way to take the sharp end of the corner. Of and course. if someone was going the perpendicular route where the corner's on their left, they should go wide. The I number agree. of times I bump into people taking the sharp corner, it's like, 
come on, you got to treat this like a road. <laughs> yeah, what was I supposed to do? Know that you were going to cut me off? <laughs> like, yeah. it's not ideal. It's Ugh. not ideal. Yeah, I would like it. Corner would be good. Corner would be good. We behind. have a failed society, and this is the reason why. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only thing that we need to fix. Percy considers warming up by buying some hot chocolate, but then he goes down a tangent and wonders, well, if I buy the hot chocolate and I grab the cup, would the cup turn invisible, or would it be floating? And he spends so much time wondering about this that then Zoe, Thalia, Bianca, and Grover walk out of the convenience store. <laughs> Now, apparently, Grover did an acorn-based tracking spell that he is 85% sure he did correctly, and that spell tells them to head towards D.C. Bianca notes that that is where her and Nico used to live, but she mentions, oh, I forgot that that's where we used to live. And I'm very intrigued because this is the second or third time that yeah. Nico and Bianca have mentioned that they have cloudy memories about their past. I really want to know. I feel like we're going to get a big reveal. Since we haven't learned it yet, mm -hmm. I feel like who their parents are is going to be a big, surprising reveal. And it might be some sort of situation where that god or someone in that sphere did some sort of spell where they can't truly remember everything from their past. Right. Like, does it really factor into their backstory and why they're coming into this novel? Or... Do they just not get enough sleep and drink way too much coffee and can't remember what happened two weeks ago? It's a tough life for 10 and 12-year-olds. For year old. example. <laughs> not to reference anything from my personal life or anything. <laughs> Zoe isn't so sure about going to D.C. because the prophecy said to go west, and that is south. Thalia challenges her by asking her if she likes her tracking abilities over Grover's, and I like that Thalia stood up for Grover here, but I don't know if we need to be combative here. We're on the same team, mm -hmm. so maybe we do a little bit of teamwork makes the dream work. We work together a little bit better. Zoe says, you challenge my skills, you scullion. You know nothing of being a hunter. And Thalia says, oh, scullion? You're calling me a scullion? What the heck is a scullion? I also wondered, I googled it, a scullion is a servant assigned the most menial kitchen tasks. That's kind of rude. Well, Those are rude. the essential workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't need to be throwing these labels Unionize around. Unionize the scullions, Mike. <laughs> we are a scullions rights podcast here. <laughs> Grover breaks up the fight and he implies that this is not the first fight that they've had. Yeah. Bianca pipes up to say that DC is their best bet. Zoe begrudgingly agrees and Thalia says that her driving is going to get them arrested since Zoe looks younger than Thalia. She looks too young to drive. But Zoe notes that she has been driving, quote, since automobiles were invented. <laughs> How old is she? <laughs> I like when Percy responds by saying, like, was that like 400 years ago? I'm like, <laughs> my, my guy, yeah. Henry Ford, 1900s. <laughs> like, what are we talking about? You don't know anything about Greek mythology and you don't know anything about United States history either. Like, what do you know about? It's so funny. Narrative Percy says, I wondered whether Zoe had been kidding. I didn't know exactly when cars were invented, but I figured that was like prehistoric times back when people watched black and white TV and hunted dinosaurs. It's so funny. It's so funny. I had a middle school teacher who was very old, my eighth grade teacher, Mrs. Woodman. She used to say, when I was in school and dinosaurs roamed the earth, which mm -hmm. was a great bit. Yeah. And she said it every single time. And I respect it so much. Percy also wonders what her age is and also Blink what vibe. Nice. And also what Mr. D was referencing as her bad experience with heroes. And I figured, yeah, we'll find out in chapter 17, as we <laughs> always find out <laughs> in these big reveals. Yes. So as they approach Washington, D.C., Blackjack is incredibly tired but refuses to admit it. He says, fine, boss, I could I could take on an army. <laughs> Percy <laughs> feels bad. Jimmy Butler meme. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like leaning over uh, the stanchion for anyone unfamiliar with basketball jimmy butler had a very exhausting game in the bubble playoff run in 2020 where there's this iconic photo of him exhausted over the sideline area because he did all the work he put the team on his back yes listen to my podcast horse it's very good <laughs> and it explains these sorts of things just give it teeing it up for you dude look it's a great show someone in the reddit the other day said something about, oh, every time Mike makes basketball references, I turn off my brain and I go, oh, basketball boy, you were talking about basketball. And I said, yes, horse can help you with this. It literally exists for, for this, this purpose. Reason. Yeah. And then someone replies, oh, that's what horse is about? I didn't know. The whole thing of horse is teaching people who don't like basketball how to follow basketball. Yes. The thesis statement is anybody can follow basketball. Come through, horse, wherever you get your podcasts. Percy feels bad. Blackjack tells him not to worry, but Percy knows that Blackjack would completely exhaust himself before complaining, and Percy doesn't want that because Percy Jackson is an empathetic king, That's and right. we love him for it. That's right. 
Now, thankfully, the van slows a bit and Percy can set Blackjack down, which is also good because Percy remembers, ah, I'm in Washington, D.C., lots of military air defense. Maybe not a good idea to be flying on a Pegasus. (laughs) He's right for that. He was ahead of the curve. Blackjack sets Percy down by the Washington Monument. The van is parked a few blocks away. Percy tells Blackjack to go back to camp, to rest, and to graze. Blackjack asks if Percy is sure, and he confirms, saying that Blackjack has done enough, and he thanks him a ton, and Blackjack says, a ton of hay, maybe, and then wishes Percy good luck by saying, I got a feeling they didn't come here to meet anything friendly and handsome like me. (laughs) I love Blackjack so much. He's really good. I want the Blackjack Rainbow the Hippocampus spinoff adventure novel little buddy cop movie with those two write it man it could you could do it as a graphic novel or maybe a zine yeah ooh, we could call it like by air and by sea yeah <laughs> don't give these ideas away for <laughs> damn, free damn 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 <laughs> disney is listening we've disney, already established on, this me. <laughs> percy sees grover point to a building in the national mall and the group nods and they head towards it percy begins to follow but he stops when he sees a gray-haired sunglasses and dark overcoat wearing man with a military buzz cut get out of a black sedan and percy admits that this could be normal for washington dc but then he recognizes the car as one he had seen near the van quite a bit so he thinks that the car has been tailing the van the man takes out his phone he says something into it and then he follows the group and then percy recognizes him as the french guy dr thorne Percy puts on the invisibility cap and follows, and he thinks that if he survived the fall, Dr. Thorne, Annabeth had to have as well. So his dreams must be rooted in reality, which is cool. Yay, Annabeth is alive, but also bad. Annabeth's in big trouble. Yeah. Percy then sees where Grover has led the group. It's the National Air and Space Museum, which Percy then identifies as the Smithsonian. I've never been there. Have you been there? I have. I actually wrote down in my notes here, the National Air and Space Museum was definitely the coolest place that 10-year-old me had ever been in my life. I was like, can we just live here? Can we just live in the National Air and Space Museum? They have like the flight simulators. They have like all the old planes. They have the rockets. And it's a very cool place. Is it a wing of the Smithsonian? Does the Smithsonian have multiple buildings? I'm just not sure how it all works. I'm not the D.C. museum expert. However, I believe that all of those like national museums in that area are like part of the Smithsonian project. Gotcha, so like, the gotcha. Smithsonian is many different things. Makes sense. OK, cool. The group enters. Thorne doesn't follow, but instead heads across the mall. So Percy follows him. Thorne goes up the stairs of the Museum of Natural History, which narrator Percy notes has a sign that says, closed for a pirate event. And the narrator Percy says, then I realized pirate must be private. And I got to say, first off, think it's cool. Love the dyslexia stuff coming in the mix. It's always fun to hear from listeners of TNO who have dyslexia if these things are accurate. So far, they all have been. Recently, I asked if the reading upside down is just as easy as right side up and Overwhelmingly, people are like, yes, it is just as difficult slash easy. I wonder if this is also a thing, and folks feel free to reach out, if it is a thing where you see a word that's kind of close to another one, and then you just fill it in, and then you have to realize, hold on, context, that didn't make any sense. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But number two, not that out of line for a Percy Jackson book if there was a pirate pirate event. event. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe not at the Museum of Natural History. (laughs) Sure, sure, sure. (laughs) Now, at this point, I realized, ha, zombies. That was the title. Is Percy or someone going to bring the stuff in the museum to life? But then I thought, eh, probably not because he learned to grow zombies, not to animate zombies. But I was just was trying to think, what could this be? So Thorne enters, Percy follows, and Thorne enters a doorway that is guarded by two guards. And Percy rushes in so that he can sneak in before they close the doors. Narrator Percy says, quote, inside what I saw was so terrible, I almost gasped out loud, which probably would have gotten me killed. And yeah, Percy wouldn't have lasted very long, clearly. No. <laughs> and we'll see later in this chapter. He doesn't last very long. We sub in tubes and he's just sneezing in the background. <laughs> Gosh, I would be so bad. I'm surprised. I don't think I've ever sneezed during a recording. Well, now it's guaranteed Because if I did, I would leave it in so I could be like, hey, everybody, you want to hear how normal and cool I sound when I sneeze? (laughs) They also kind of sound like coughs. So if people don't know me, there's two things that happen. One, they think, wow, this guy sneezed five times. What a weirdo. Or people go, were those coughs or sneezes? I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say God bless you or not. (laughs) Also, very cool during COVID times when sneezing and coughing are both no-goes and I do it like a monster. You just can't be doing that. You just can't be doing that. Mm -hmm. So, a dozen mortal guards are on a balcony. 
two reptilian women with double snake trunks instead of legs. And Percy clarifies that Annabeth has called these types of creatures Scythian? 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 Dracani? No idea. I'll have to ask Dr. Moya, how do you pronounce this word? <laughs> so many, so many So many vowels. possibilities. Just unbelie- <laughs> unbelievable amount of vowels. <laughs> it's hard. Sometimes the C's are hard. Sometimes the C's are soft. The Y's can be long or short. Greek I would have guessed, can be I would have guessed Scythian because of the scythe like the weapon. Yes. That would have been my guess. Let's go with that. And if Bobby is wrong, tweet at Apparent and Google on Twitter. <laughs> But the worst thing here is that between the women is Luke, who Percy is convinced is looking directly at him. He probably isn't, though. But narrator Percy says, quote, he looked terrible. His skin was pale and his blonde hair looked almost gray as if he'd aged 10 years in just a few months. The angry light in his eyes was still there. And so was the scar down the side of his face where a dragon had once scratched him. But the scar was now ugly red as though it had recently been reopened. And I love the evil making him slowly look worse and worse sort of situation. He's clearly going through it, but I think that describing him like this allows the reader to start to like, and without getting too ahead of ourselves here, but parse him as like two different people, basically. Like it was like the Luke before and now this Luke who's really starting to look different, as basic as it seems and as like lizard brain as it seems almost. But I think that like readers and viewers and, and movies and stuff like that really do associate color palettes with different types of things and like going grayer, having the red scar across your face, just think allows you to like keep that distinction in your mind that these people have very real relationships with him before he was like this. And now they're starting to watch it unfold from afar that he looks very different and is behaving very differently. Yeah, that's a really good point. I also think it's good because when we first meet Luke, he's surfer dude, sandy yeah. hair, attractive, happy, smiling. So you can just compare and contrast original Luke, who I loved early book, even maybe our episodes. I was like, Luke is great. Yeah, and then you did say that. <laughs> and then as it goes on, then it's the Luke we have now, which is I hate Luke. All my homies hate Luke. But I think that this is a better version of what I have at least seen. I don't know if other YA series do this, but in Harry Potter, you had a worse version of this, which was all the good people are hot and all the evil people are ugly. This is not necessarily saying that he looks pretty versus ugly. It's just he looked happy and smiling and he had kind eyes and now he looks angry and not great. And it's not that he's ugly. It's just that he looks more evil and it's more suiting and it kind of gives him a physical like you're saying manifestation of what's happened inside of him it's not oh he's gross because at no point did they say that he looked unattractive it's just that he's got a different vibe because if richard greer has proven us anything it's that you can gray at an early age and be totally hot (laughs) as hell and it's fine (laughs) yeah the life and the vivacity has come out of him a little bit and that sort Mm -hmm. of allows you to understand both physically and qualitatively what is changing about him Mm -hmm. so next to luke is a man and all percy can see is his knuckles on the gilded arms of what looks like a throne my guess was the general and in the next sentence we learn it's the general i'm so glad i read this before i listened to you make a joke about the shack commercials because (laughs) otherwise it would have maybe like slightly ruined part of this book for me with the general (laughs) yes now to potentially get the bad CGI general from the auto insurance commercials out of your brain. What I'm imagining here, just because of this description and what we learned in the recent chapters where he has a very, very deep voice. Mm -hmm. If all you can see is arms on a chair and a really deep voice, is this guy just the claw from Inspector Gadget? (laughs) Wow, Inspector Gadget reference. Love to see it. I loved that show as a kid. I don't know if that was too ahead of your time because I know you're a couple years younger than me. I was in on the Disney Channel original movies. Okay, the ones with Matthew Broderick? Yes. Okay, they're fun, but the cartoon is where I was at. And that guy's voice, he was really with the like, oh, Gadget, (laughs) I'll get you next time. (laughs) Like, that's a really solid... And he would always just have, you know, the Mm metallic-looking hand, and then he had his cat or whatever... It's very much a vibe where all you see is the hands. So this is kind of what I'm imagining now for the general. Thorne confirms to the general that the group is here. And the general asks where specifically. And Thorne says the Rocket Museum. And then Luke corrects him to say the Air and Space Museum, which, (laughs) okay, like, 
Who cares? I don't know why this was a sticking point. We later get to see that these two don't really like each other. So maybe it's just any excuse to try to make yourself look better than Dr. Thorne. But I don't know if someone called the Natural History Museum, the Dinosaur Museum, or if someone called the Met, the Sphinx Museum, I'd be like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yes, exactly. (laughs) All practical purposes, I understand what you're talking about. Exactly. We don't need to do this. But then Dr. Thorne hits him with, as you say, sir. And Percy can sense that there is true disgust in his voice. So I'm wondering, will we get some sort of classic henchman type thing where out of spite for the other person, is one going to turn on the other? Yeah. I wonder if that is being planted here or if it's just some sort of text of these two dudes just don't like each other. Thorne relays that the group is four people deep and it's got Grover. And then he says, quote, the, how do you say, punk clothes and the horrible shield, (laughs) which Luke clarifies is Thalia. Thorne continues to say that there are two hunters, one of which is the one with the silver circlet. And then the general admits that he knows who that is. There are so many things being planted about Zoe in this chapter and the chapter prior. I am so curious. Uh, I'm really, really intrigued to know. One of the things that I really love about the Zoe character, but really about the dynamic of this book up until this point, is that I feel like second, third, fourth, like the middle books of series often run into this problem where you can't keep the same group together as the original book because then it would be too static for the reader. But once you break up the original group, like once Annabeth is no longer there, those dynamics that you relied on in the first book that people came to love, you are missing out on those. Like, this is a problem that I think the most recent season of Stranger Things ran into, where everybody had, like, a different storyline, and it was like, I kind of just want to see all these people together at the same time. What Rick does so well in this book is that he's actually fleshing out this character. He's making you interested in Zoe. Right. He's making you care more about what's going on with Zoe and these seeds he's planting than even what danger Annabeth is into right now that you're not even seeing. And so I think it's such a really important distinction as you get towards middle books. And something that recommends the series so well is that whatever group of people are there, whatever band they've gotten back together, whatever Mission Impossible style (laughs) mission that they have to complete, you understand that the group dynamic, everybody matters within it. There's no like bit character that you just don't really care about at all. You're invested in all of these people at this point. Right. You are 100% spot on. And I think Rick's skill is making you like a character in a really short amount of time. Even yes. a character that you didn't previously like. It wasn't is a, a superpower. Big... He, gets, he jumps right into it. Like, he wastes no time. He jumps right into the middle of the action, right into the middle of teaching you who this character is, for sure. Mm-hmm. And even with Zoe, I didn't like her before this. She was kind of a stick in the mud. But over the past couple of chapters, we've learned she's got maybe a tragic backstory. She has some sort of history with this evil guy who I definitely don't like. She's at least intriguing of how the hell old is she yeah so in just a matter of like a chapter and a half i've gone from i don't like zoe to i'm incredibly interested in zoe and this happened with any sort of character you love tyson after two chapters you love sally you know her for a couple paragraphs and then she's gone it's astonishing and it's something that my wife kelly she's just finished the heroes of olympus series Mm -hmm. so the sequel series and i know that new characters keep getting introduced in this book series and throughout. And I feel like it's a recurring thing of every time she starts either a new book or a new series, she goes, oh, I got to meet all these new people. I want to see my old friends. And then two chapters in, she's like, I I love love my new friends. I love these people. They're great. Yeah, exactly. And I do think it is a little bit of his superpower as a writer. Yeah, it's truly, truly impressive stuff. I am floored by how quickly he can make me fall in love with a character. And yeah, it's fun. He finds really good ways to shuffle up the group where we didn't have that much of Grover in the second book, but now he's back here. We don't have Annabeth as much in this one. I'm sure she's going to come in the end. Just like Grover did in the, in the end. first book. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thalia is a tree. Now Thalia is here. We didn't even have to learn how Thalia went from tree form to person to close-ish friend with Percy. Just I mean, it's happened f- to all of us. We all know how you go from a tree to a person. <laughs> He's just natural. Just, yeah. But even with that, he did enough stuff where when I first read the first chapter of this book, I thought, man, I don't really know about Thalia. I want to, maybe we'll get a flashback or whatever. Now I'm like, I don't need a flashback. I feel like I know enough about her. I love yeah. Thalia. Her and I are listening to My Chemical Romance together on yes. the bus on the way into middle school. Like, we're good. We're good. Yeah. I understand her. Yeah. He's really good at it. He's really, really good at it. So Luke asks the general to let him take on the group, but the general tells him to be patient and that he has sent a, quote, little playmate, gross terminology here, to keep them occupied. 
Luke tries to protest. Pass. The, <laughs> hard hard pass. pass. Luke tries to protest, but the general says that they cannot risk him and calls him my boy, which Thorne pounces on the opportunity to use as a dig by saying, yes, boy, in italics, <laughs> you are much too fragile to risk. Let me, in italics, finish them off. The gener- Has anyone memed you into looking like Bomb Voyage yet? I said it in the end. No, no one has memed me into it. I did reference it on an earlier episode. No, I know. That's why but I heard yeah, you yeah, say yeah. this. And <laughs> I feel like somebody needs to take one of your headshots and make you look like Bomb Voyage. I don't know if I'm as swole as Bomb Voyage. I do have the long enough face right. to yeah, do yeah, Bomb the, Voyage. Like, ov- oval face, <laughs> yeah. yes. Did he have a cleft chin, though? I don't have a cleft chin. I'm not out here. everybody in Incredibles just has like a really sharp looking jawline. I do have an intense jawline and a neck that is so long that someone once asked if I photoshopped a picture of myself for a bit, which was a very (laughs) cool comment to receive on (laughs) Facebook.com. Thank you, Mark Zuckerberg, for making all of this possible. But yeah, I mean, I'm not like, I'm not going to out here ask for it. I could have to do way more push ups. I feel like he was a big, like, I feel like <laughs> he, he had was, a big upper body. Yeah, built a little bit like a fire hydrant. <laughs> a and bit. then he had the big, like, lanky legs. Yeah. But no, I mean, potential Halloween costume. That would be a real yes, fun one to vil- dress up Villains as. from Incredibles. That's a really good Halloween costume. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even <gasps> my wife Kelly's very short. She could be the mole or the underminer or whatever. Oh, the. <laughs> I'm the underbody. Like, that'd be pretty good. That would be it's really good. good. Wow. You might have to cut this out of the pod so no one steals it. TM, 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 TM. <laughs> or, no, 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 you can do this. But as the rule Credit. of all the times, you got to, if anyone says, Link to I the love newest Olympian podcast. <laughs> yes, you get index cards with a little QR code. And if someone says, oh my God, I love your costume, you hand them a little. This is where I heard about it first. <laughs> exactly. All you got to do is give the proper credit. We call that viral marketing in the business, baby. Look, word of mouth is huge for podcasting. <laughs> I'm so appreciative to all the folks who have told people in person to listen to this show because it really does help. Even like iTunes reviews and stuff, that kind of helps. That's like the next step down. But any sort of weird thing to get the word out there about the pod, I'm going to take it. And I will thank you for it. (laughs) Look, if you want to do this, go do it. It will help the pod and people will love you for it. Anyway, Percy Jackson podcast. Let's get back to it. We are nearing the end, but let's get to a good stopping point. The general says no and rises from his chair. And when he does so, it allows Percy to get a good look at him. And we'll end this episode on this chilling description of this I don't even know what he is. Don't know if he's a dude or a god or a demigod or what. It's intriguing. Narrator Percy says, He was tall and muscular, with light brown skin and slicked back dark hair. He wore an expensive brown silk suit like the guys on Wall Street wear, but you'd never mistake this dude for a broker. He had a brutal face, huge shoulders, and hands that could snap a flagpole in half. His eyes were like stone. I felt as if I were looking at a living statue. It was amazing he could even move. It's a great description. It is very good. The writing is really powerful at the end of this chapter. There was another line that I wrote down where they describe mortals as weak-minded, easily bought, and violent. And mm-hmm. I was like, he's not wrong. Nope, not wrong. <laughs> he's not wrong. Cutting straight to the core there. Right at it. And we will get into that in the next episode. But we are at time here. Bobby, thank you so much for coming on. You will be on for the next episode, which we'll record in a couple minutes after I refill my water. But if people can't wait that long to hear your voice again, where can they find you? Or read you doing things elsewhere, anything that they need that Bobby Wagner content, where can they get it? Uh, if you like baseball and or labor and or me making jokes with my best friend at the world you can find me on the tipping pitches podcast uh and you can follow me on twitter at b wags b w a g s mm-hmm. thank you so much shoops this is so much fun this is a blast excited to have you back but until next time when we figure out what is going on with this general and the whole museum adventure until then i'll see you later Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of The New Stone Olympian. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schuber. I also run the social media and the website. Our editor is Sherry Guo. The music is by Bettina Campamanas and Brandon Grugel, and the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. In case you haven't heard, we have lots of TNO live shows coming up. Some of them have streaming components. You can get tickets to all of those upcoming shows at thenewsolympian.com slash live. If you're all caught up in the show and you just can't get enough, I'd recommend checking out our Patreon. At thenewsolympian.com slash Patreon, you can get access to a bunch of bonus content. You'll also be able to watch that Hades the Video Game stream that Stephen Para and I are doing slash have done depending on when you're listening to this and you'll also get access to our discord community which is a lot of fun if you're looking to find other communities that aren't linked to the patreon you can find us on social media we're at newest olympian on twitter instagram and facebook and we also have a subreddit reddit.com slash r slash the newest olympian and i also just launched a tiktok that is being run by sherry it's at newest olympian as well i'd also love to give a big shout out to our producer level patrons lot of bartova kelsey gillespie the damn steam nuggets emma cooey vicky garcia ellie house veronica bartova Haley hastings robin garcia freed of extra megan 
Moon, Tough Bay Fong, Moo Moo Productions, Olivia Y, Craig McRoberts, Taylor Payne, Giselle Salvador, Can't I Seaweed Brain, Peter Johnson, The Twin, Sabrina Balsiger, Bony Pony, Heather McMillan, Casey Williams, Polly Burge, Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Bridget Lowry, Josh Sayer, Josh Wilkie, Abby Ryan, Wise Girl, Ashton Gabrielson, Colby, Marco Redhouse, Falcon Joey, James Christopher, William Boucher, Lux, Caden Max, Sam Sam Reby, Carly Allen, Riley Kitas, Mary Kelly, Audra McKenzie, Mrs. O'Leary, Aaron Wood, Tyler Hendricks, Molly Snyder, Rodith Kalna, Milo Kim, Fred Cabras, Harlan Christ, CC Reads 23, Sand Cop, Julia Kendall, ML Oscar Thomason, Noah Bundgaard, Liz Cardigan, Shatzebobs, and Heck Emily. If you want to help out the show non monetarily, the best way to do so is via word of mouth. Whether you tell someone about the show who you think would like the show, someone who loves Percy Jackson, or someone who's been looking for an excuse to read Percy Jackson, or if you talk about us on social media, or if you leave us a rating and review on whatever podcasting app you're using, any of those help, and I appreciate anyone who has done or will do those in the future. But I'm just so thankful that you listened to this episode and hope you tune into our next episode where we will be joined again by Bobby Wagner to discuss the rest of Chapter 9 and all of Chapter 10 of The Titan's Curse. But until then, I'll proceed later. Hey everyone, how's it going? It's me, ASMR Mike. What I'm going to be doing for this ASMR Mike segment is taking a copy of The Titan's Curse and flipping through different pages of it and stuff to get some book ASMR uh, from the microphone on my phone. Hopefully it sounds pretty good. Here we go. Thank you for listening.